Uh, go ahead and grab a seat. Um, my name is Ricky. I serve as one of the pastors here. Um, do you ever see something in life where it just kind of creates this reaction in you and you just feel something inside of you or you're like, hey, something has to be done about that. Um, <clears throat> something needs to change. You need to stop that. Make something happen. Whatever it is, uh, you just feel something and you think, hey, I, somebody needs to act on that. Um, here's a couple, <clears throat> excuse me, couple pictures, you know, maybe you're just kind of like, you know, maybe they kind of trigger something in you. So, so yeah, right. You know, there's like that one green one over there. Maybe you're like, Hey, that, that needs to be moved to the green pile. Or, or maybe you're like, Nope, I'm actually just going to mess with them all the more, but maybe that kind of does it. This one, you see that, how the pie's cut and you're like, I know who that person is at Thanksgiving. They cut the pie all wrong and it messes it up. That one, yeah. People that do house projects, what if that was like stuck on there and you're like, uh, okay. Kid cat, right? You're just like, nope, nope. You're just like, you can't eat it like that. You can't just take a bite out of it. This is it. We're not animals here. You have to break it up. Ooh. This one, right? Like there's no sound coming from it, but it's in your brain of like, ee, and you, if that was happening, you're just like, ah. Stop it! You know, you'd have to, have to act, have to intervene. This one. Okay, if you're like, I don't see anything wrong with the picture. There's something wrong with you. Okay, you're the problem. Okay, you don't cook steak. Well done. That's just not, no. You watch a cooking show, Bobby Flay. He'd be like, this is, this is bad cook. Get in this back. Right? It's, it's medium to medium rare. That, that, those are acceptable ranges. Yeah, you just be like, something's got to change here. This one, this one's personal for me. Star Wars Episode Eight, right? All of those other photos are just cringeworthy, and you get to this, and you're just like, "That was terrible." What were you thinking? You just ruined it. We need to re we need to change that. Something needs to be done. We need to okay. And if you're like, "Man, Ricky, you have a problem with Star Wars," true. So, but but we all see these things in in our, in our life, and we we have these these motivations, right? The, these feelings inside of us, and 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 they cause us. To act. I mean, think of other situations in your life. Have you ever been in a place, maybe like a grocery store or the zoo or something like that? And you're like, hey, you see that kid crying. And they're like, well, you know, they're just crying. They're by themselves and they're just thinking, and they're like, where's my mom? Where's my dad? And you're kind of looking, I mean, you feel it. And you're looking around. I don't know where they are. They're bad parents. I don't know. Um, well, you probably ran off. And, you, and you're, you're like, man, I should just go do something. But you're like, I don't know if their parents are standing right there with this kid freak out because I'm a stranger. I don't know, but you, but you feel it, right? And you think, I got to do something. Maybe, maybe you are going through the mail and you get a bill and you're just like, oh gosh, not another one of these. I, I can't, and, and you, just, you, just feel, you just feel dread. And you just think, I can't even open this right now. You push it aside. Can't face it. You, you walk into your house and it's just, there, it is just like, what, like, everybody has collectively decided to be slobs, and your house is, is in utter disarray, and you just, you, you kind of either react, I'm going to punch it out and clean it up, or you're like, you know what, I feel utterly overwhelmed, I'm going to go just lock myself in my room. I just can't face this. And so, we, we all have these things, the, these things inside of us that, that motivate us, that move us to act. Maybe, maybe it's anger. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's comfort, maybe it's approval of others, getting, getting that next job, getting more money and success. Whatever it is that, that is in you really moves you to act. Have you ever really wondered what, what, what really moves God? What, what, is, what is going on in the inside of God? Why does he do what he does? Not, not that God is kind of like OCD like us or out of control or anything like that, but what is so deep within God's heart that really causes him to do what he does? And so today's passage, that we're, that's what we're going to be looking at. What, what really moves God and, and how that doesn't just move Jesus and what he does, but also how should that impact us in what we do? So if you've got a Bible, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew's in the New Testament first book, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Matthew 9, 
And this, this, is, this is it, verse 35. Jesus continued to go all around to the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues. It's kind of like their Jewish places of worship, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and he's healing every disease and every sickness. And so this is kind of this summary statement. Hey, this is what Jesus has been doing. He's been preaching the good news, teaching the people about God, who he is telling them to repent, and then he's healing people, he healing all these diseases, all the sicknesses. And then this, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them. So, so the first thing that we see is this, Jesus' motivation. Jesus' motivation, he feels compassion for them. And if you've got a Bible, circle, underline that. He felt compassion for them. So, so there's something within Jesus, within himself. His heart is stirred. He has, he has this deep emotion. It's compassion, sympathy. Now that word here, compassion, means to suffer with. And I mean, if you notice, even just a couple of verses above this, verse 34, the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus. They're accusing him, hey, all of these miracles that you're doing, all these people that you're healing, that's, you're actually doing that by the power of Satan. And so, so he's, he's having all this criticism heaped on him, but his reaction isn't like, hey, how do I get those people to stop criticizing me? Hey, do, how, how do I tell them, to, how do I make them stop? He just actually ignores them and continues to move forward into the business of what the Father has called him to do. And so he sees the people. A lot of times I think we think that God just turns a blind eye to a lot of what's going on. Hey, does God really see? Does God really know? Is he really aware? It says that he sees the crowds. Jesus notices. Jesus knows what's going on. And he has this love for them, this compassion. This, he takes pity on them. So we just see his, his motivation. In this. And, and this is not something that that because that, we could think, oh yeah, that sounds like Jesus. That sounds like New Testament God, but it doesn't sound like Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God's cranky, He's grumpy. Jesus is not so much. But this is actually because there's really just one God. It's not Old Testament God, New Testament God. It's just really one God. This is actually something we see throughout Scripture. And so, some, let me just kind of walk you through. Hey, this is what we see in just what the the Bible is teaching us. Psalm 84. 15 says, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Psalm 145, 8 and 9, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, great and faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. Even when God is talking to Moses and says, hey, this is who I am. He talks about him being slow to anger that he's compassionate, that he's a loving God. Hey, does, does God take sin seriously? Is God holy and just and all those things? Yes. But, but even when it comes to, to sin, I mean, it, this is what God says in Ezekiel 33, 11. He says, tell them, as I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather, this is what I want, this is what I desire, but rather that the wicked person should turn from his way and live. Repent, repent of your evil ways. So even, even in that, even in, yeah, even in sin, he's like, well, actually, I just really want you to turn away from that and turn to me. I'm not just ready to get you. And then we go to the New Testament, John 3, 16, right? We know it, for God so what? Loved. What was moving in the heart of God? God so loved the world. And I love you. That's why I'm sending you my son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we're sinners, Christ died for us. Even just one chapter later in Matthew, so just a couple, couple verses later, this is what it says in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary, weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and I will give you rest for your souls. And I'm lowly, I'm humble, I'm gentle in spirit. And he desires people to come to him. He's motivated by this compassion, this love and care for, for people. And so let, let's keep going. Verse, verse 36, he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because, what's going on? They were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. 
People being harassed. They're oppressed. They're troubled. They're in this sad and pitiful state. And, and, and Jesus sees them in the state that they're on, and he's like, man, I feel something deeply about that. And, and yeah, I'm sure that the, the people there, that they're under a Roman oppression, and I'm sure a lot of it had to do with, some of it had to do with that, some of it had to do with maybe just the, their, their leaders of the day and all of that. But, but notice it says, hey, because they're, they're troubled because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Man, these, these people don't know where to go. I mean, they're, they're, they're directionless. I don't think it's just so much about their circumstances of just their, their, their kind of their life, but something deeper within them. I like what somebody pointed out in our city group on Thursday. It was, hey, this is, it's kind of like uh, the Ninevites with Jonah. It said they didn't, they didn't know their left hand from their right hand. Man, they, they're, just, they're just lost. And Jesus sees the people and it's like, man, they're running after everything else except me. And they're running after success or sex or, or money or all these things. They're trying to get all this, this satisfaction and none of that is really going to do anything for them. It's not, it's not going to deliver. It's still going to leave them empty. Reminds me of, of Jeremiah 2.13. God says, for my people have committed a double evil. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water. They've abandoned me. But what have they done? And they've dug cisterns for themselves. It's like they're, getting, they're making their own jars. You could have the living water, a fountain giving forth water, but instead you made yourself a little jar that leaks and you're trying to put water in it and it's leaking all over the place. That's like what the people, back then there's still people of, of today, it's like, man, you're looking for everything else to fill you. Everything else to satisfy and it's just not working. You're like sheep without a shepherd. I mean, can you imagine... Walking in on somebody, walking into their house, um, I mean, I guess you're invited, um, and, and you see them over there, and they're, they're washing dishes, and they're using a plunger to do it. And at first, you're like, that's funny, because why would you be using a plunger? I don't, have you used a plunger previously in its intended purposes? I hope not. But I mean, let's say that they're like, yeah, I was just in the bathroom, and you know what, and I brought it in here, and, and I'm washing these dishes with it. I mean, after, and if, let's say they really thought, this is what you do. This is how you clean the dishes. This is the best way. I mean, after a while, you'd be like, ah, this is not funny. Like, you really believe that. Hey, that, that plunger, that's not, that's not its intended purpose. You're using it, using it in a terrible way. You're actually making, because you're using it, you're actually making it worse. I'd rather eat off the other dishes that were just dirty rather than plunger wash dishes. If that is true, how you would feel for somebody using a plunger in the wrong way, what about for somebody using their life in the wrong way? And you're created for a purpose, for, for, for something beautiful, for a relationship with God, love with God, love with others. And it's like, man, you're using your life in a way that it was never intended to be. It's heartbreaking. And then Jesus sees the people, sees, sees people today. And it's like, man, that's not what I have for your life. Don't, don't you know what life really is? It isn't found in trying to prove yourself to God, trying to get God to like you. It's not, it's not found in just kind of like religious practices and being good enough. It's not found in success or just comfort. Trying to get this Relationship that, that's not really ultimately going to satisfy. Man, you're, you're like helpless. You're like sheep without a shepherd. You don't know where you're going. This is what Jesus sees, and he's moved within himself, motivated by this compassion and love. And I think this question comes to us. Man, do we see what Jesus sees? Do we feel what Jesus feels? And when you look at your people in your house, People in your neighborhood, people in your workplace, or do you see them the way that Jesus sees them? 
that your eye, you're, you're moved to compassion towards them. Yeah, they might be annoying. They might be doing things you don't like, and you might not agree with them on, on a variety of things, but man, is your heart moved to compassion for them because they're a person, a person that God loves, a person that's made in the image of God. And so we see here that, that just the motivation of Jesus. Next, we're going to see Jesus' mission. Verse 37, so Jesus' motivation, that's Jesus' mission. Verse 37 says, Then to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. And so when he says the harvest, it's talking about bringing in the crop. Man, it's been a good year. Right? He says it's plentiful. Man, the, there's a lot of crops going. And they've, they've grown great. And what he's saying is like bringing the people in, bringing the people to himself. God's drawing people to himself. And, and this is Jesus' mission. Jesus is all about, man, I'm going to the people, drawing people to myself. And this is, again, not just like something new with Jesus. This is the mission that God has been on from the beginning. I mean, th th let's just think about it. Let's, let's start the Old Testament. We'll work away a little bit. In Genesis 3, God gave them one command. Hey, Adam and Eve, don't do that. Just don't eat it. You're free to eat whatever else you want, but don't do that. They sin. They disobey God. What do they do? Do they go to God or they go hide? Right? They hide. What does God do? God comes to them. God comes looking for them. Right? God is pursuing people, revealing who he is to people. God comes to Abraham. Abraham's a pagan. He lives in another country. He's not, he's not really concerned with what God's doing. He doesn't even really know God. God comes to him and says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Not just so that you'll be blessed, but I'm going to bless you so that you will be a blessing to the nations. In Exodus, when the people, the Israelites, they're slavery to, to the Egyptians. And this is, God, God hears their cries, and this, this is what God says is going to happen. It's Exodus 6. He's talking to Moses, and he says, Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out, out from the first labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. So that's the part we're kind of familiar with. Yep, that's what you're going to do. You're going to free them, and you're going to do it with these cool plagues and all this stuff. This will be neat. But then Jesus, or God tells Moses, hey, here's why I'm doing this. Because I'm gonna t I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from Egypt, out from forced labor. So God says, hey, this is the anticipated outcome of the, of the Exodus, is that you will know me. I'm revealing myself to you, and I'm bringing you out. Yes, freeing you from these bad circumstances, but to me, drawing you to me so you will know me. De Deuteronomy 4, it says, man, this is, I've shown you these things so that you'll know that he is the Lord your God and that there is no other. Even throughout the Old Testament, when the, when the people go into exile because of their sin, because of their disobedience to God, God's not just like, hey, you stink, bat. He's like, man, I'm actually sending you in exile so that I could bring you back to myself, so that you can know me. And then what do we have happen in John, or in the New Testament? Then God, the Father, sends Jesus the Son. Matthew 1, and she will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. God so loved the world that he sent his son. Jesus said over and over, I have, I have come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus says, I, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners come for the sake. I've come that you may have life. I've come to be a light in the darkness. Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law. And then, well, how did he fulfill the law? Jesus even tells us in Luke 24. He says, man, th this was all written. The prophets, the law, everything was written so that it might be fulfilled that, so that through the Messiah, that he would suffer and die and raise on the third day. And so that um, the, for, and, and that repentance or forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in his name to the nations. I'm doing all of this. Why? Because I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And so that the good news might be preached so that people would know me. People from all nations. All of the scripture finds its focus and fulfillment in this. 
And so this is the mission of God, drawing people to himself, pursuing people. And then even how the, the Bible ends, Revelation 21, John, John writes this, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, is with his people, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. And the story, even, even the Bible itself is God saying, hey, I'm revealing myself to you. I've given you my word so that you might know me. I'm sending you the prophets so that you might know me. I'm sending my son so that you might know me. I'm he's constantly on mission, moving towards people, revealing himself. He sees our desperate need for him so that we might know him. And the, so Jesus says, this is, this is my mission. He says, man, the harvest is plentiful. There are just lots of people to reach. This is a big job. There's lots going on. God is, has a lot of work to do. So that's, you know, we've seen his motivation. We've seen his mission. This be, the harvest being plentiful leads us to the third point is this. We see Jesus' means. Jesus' means. And so in verse 37, it says, And he said to the disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And so this is Jesus' response. Hey, I'm, I love people. I'm, I see them. I move to compassion towards them. Hey, now my response, I'm going to send my people to them. Disciples, go. Workers, need more workers. Notice Jesus didn't say, man, I have compassion on these people. I got this. This, this is all me. It's a solo act. He, he didn't do that. Jesus didn't say, man, I see all these people. They're helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Hey, let's get a bigger crowd. Let's just get more watchers. More just people sitting in a seat. Right? That, no, he says, man, I, I'm a sin people. I'm, I'm going to actually invite people into my compassionate heart and to do what I'm doing so that we might be doing this together. And, and this, is, this is a truth that I really want us to get today, and it, it's this. Whatever God is going to do in this world, whatever God is going to do, his mission, whatever God is going to do in this world, he's primarily going to do it through his people. Whatever God is going to do in this world, he's primarily going to do through people. God created a garden. It's good. And then what does God tell Adam and Eve? Take care of it. Come, join me in cultivating my good creation. Again, God tells Abraham, hey, I'm going to bless you to bless the nations. Come, join with me in, in what I'm doing. God hears the cries of the Israelites in Egypt. What does he do? Moses, I'm going to send you to them. And then Jesus sees the people, sees the harvest, and it's not by accident that then we see Jesus sending out the 12 disciples. This is what God does. God, God is moving, God is active, but he's primarily working through us, through people. Hey, hey, disciples, you've been kind of watching, and that's awesome, but now it's time to get involved. And he's wanting to awaken a similar compassion, a similar heart in his disciples. For them to see what Jesus sees, for them to feel what Jesus feels, and for them to do what Jesus does. Because, because for, for, for people that have trust in Christ, we're not just saved from our sin, we're not just saved from something, but we're saved to something. We're saved to God and to his mission. This is Ephesians 2, 8 9. It says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And it is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not from works so that no one can boast. Hey, you're saved by grace. It's unmerited, undeserved favor. But it doesn't stop there. For we are God's workmanship. We're his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. Hey, you're saved from your sin by my grace, but you're also saved to join me in doing what I'm doing. Because the gospel doesn't only save us, the gospel shapes us. The Bible doesn't really have a category for just, hey, you're saved from your sin and whatever. 
but it, and that, the, the gospel that doesn't shape you or transform you. And so Jesus says, man, hey, the, there's this mission, there's this harvest, it's plentiful. There's a lot of people to share with, a lot of disciples being made, but he says, hey, but the workers are few. There's a stat out there, and I mean, it just seems to be typically true of, of it just keeps being repeated because it seems to be true. It says that 20% of people in a church do all of the work. So, the, so this problem that Jesus sees, hey, the workers are few, it's not just a problem for then, it's a problem for today. And so, so why is that? Well, why is it that, the, that there are few workers? And, and, and let's, say, let's admit, because a lot of times we just don't see ourselves as laborers. We don't see ourselves as, as workers. We don't like, we, we like being watchers. We don't like being servants. And also if you're thinking, hey, Ricky, this is probably just easier for you because you're like a paid Christian. You know, you're, you're a pastor. I just want to tell you, like, it, it's not. I mean, there's a lot of times where I, even being a pastor, I'm like, boo. Man, I don't really want to go serve that person. And if you're thinking, man, is he talking about me? Probably. <laughs> right? I mean, it, I mean it's, it's hard. It, it's not always fun. And so, so what hinders us from joining with God and what he's doing, from being laborers? I mean, just a few things. I mean, one of the things I think is we feel inadequate. We don't think we're legit enough. We don't know enough. We're not smart enough. What if people ask me a question that I don't know? I could get that. There's, I mean, seriously, there's lots of times where I'm like, I've been doing ministry for 17 years, and there's times I'm just like, Man, I don't feel legit. Man, what, what goofball shows Star Wars picks? I can tell you who doesn't. That legit pastor down over there. They're awesome. I don't feel that I always really know what I'm doing. And I'm sure you, you guys face that. And that, that's why I love in chapter 10, it lists the, two, the 10 disciples or 12 disciples. And I mean, look, it's just like this ragtag bunch of random people. Hey, you got, a, you got some fishermen. You got, you got a, a tax collector, you got a zealot, I don't know, what does that even mean? I guess he's just passionate about stuff. I don't know, he's this kind of revolutionary guy. And then you have, these, I mean, you got a betrayer, and then you have people you're like, I don't even know who those are. James, son of Alphalius, what's that guy? Mm -hmm. He's not even legit to say anything else about. Right, but you, so you just have these random guys, these uneducated guys. And, and here's the thing, not just with the disciples, but you see it throughout Acts and really through church history. It's not about extraordinary people doing an extraordinary things. It's about an extraordinary God doing extraordinary things through ordinary people. Man, so, so don't worry about if you're like, like legit enough. And, and, and notice that Jesus gave them authority. That's something that they didn't have. It wasn't like, oh, they're super skilled, but it's like, no, you need some. I'm going to give you authority. I'm going to give you these things so you could do it. Another, another thing that I think hinders us from being a, a, kind of a servant or a laborer is we'll say, you know, we'll just kind of say something like this, well, my heart's not in it, or that's just kind of not my thing. You know, I get this. We, we want to serve God with, with a cheerful heart. We want to share the, the gospel with a cheerful heart. But I, but I think what has happened is that because we don't feel like doing something, we don't, you know, our heart's not kind of in it, if you will, what has happened, rather than doing something for God, obeying him, following him with reluctance, instead of doing that, we've just chosen to not follow God, not obey him with a cheerful heart. Does that make sense? We're just like, well, I just won't serve, but I'll be happy about it. Because I don't feel like doing it. I, just, I feel like doing nothing. So I'll just not obey God with a cheerful heart. And I don't want this to sound harsh, but I would just say, like, God's goal is not catering to your feelings. Right? Like, your goal shouldn't be about your feelings and just getting what you want. Right? It's about obeying God. And, and, and just... Following him, and so, so I'd say, man, if, you're, if your heart's not in it, just can obey God and act in faith that he's going to change you. I, th I think another reason we don't is, is just because there's a cost. Right? Being, a, being a servant, being, a, being a, a laborer for the kingdom of God, pursuing others, it's hard. I mean, it, 
you probably, I mean, it, it is inconvenient to invite your neighbor into your home. You probably don't just get along with them super well. They're probably not as fun as somebody else. And you're like, man, I don't, I don't agree on everything. I don't know if I want to share Christ with them or that person from my coworker. Ugh. It feels really uncomfortable and inconvenient. Or, or if you're like, hey, I'm going to be consistent in pursuing community in my, in my city group. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a way to contribute rather than just consume. Right? I get it. It's tough. But here's the thing. You will spend your life serving something. It's either yourself and your own interests, somebody else's interests, or God's. And so you could spend your life either serving your temporary kingdom or God's eternal kingdom. Because I get it, discipleship costs, but also non-discipleship costs. I mean, Jesus says, what good is it? What good is it for you to gain the whole world? For you to get everything you wanted? Have a really posh, comfortable life? What good is it if you get all of that, but yet forfeit your soul? And last thing, I mean, let's just kind of admit that e even when I talk about these things, and it's like, hey, we could join God in what he's doing and, and share the gospel. People love people, serve one another, can pray for one another. It feels kind of like a drag. It's kind of like, uh. it's not like, heck yeah, that's me. Thanks, pastor. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard. You know, sometimes I get asked these questions, this question, it's kind of a little bit different. It'll be like, hey, if you could do anything besides being a pastor, what would you do? Or what would be kind of like the coolest day of your life? I'll admit they all end up at one place. And yes, I'm a, I'm a nerd and that's about to show. But what would be super awesome if I could do something else would be if I got a knock on my door and it was John Favreau and Dave Filoni. They're the guys that are creating The Mandalorian, a lot of Marvel stuff, Star Wars stuff. And they just say, hey, Ricky, well, you know my name. Uh, <laughs> this is amazing. And they're like, hey, we would like for you to work with us in creating the next Mandalorian season, the next wave of Star Wars, the next, you know, some other Marvel stuff. And hey, also we'd like to work, you to work with us to just totally redo the sequel trilogy because we know it was trash. <laughs> and I'd be like, this is a good day. I mean, I'm like, heck yeah, they were bad. Let's get to work. Church, it's been fun, but I don't know, sabbatical or something. Star Wars, you know, <laughs> like, some of you are like, man, you're obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's better than, you know, Alex and his lawn stuff. But, <laughs> uh, I mean, that would be awesome, right? And, and, and there's probably something that's less nerdy for you that you would be like, man, that would be so cool if, if I could hang out with this celebrity or this person for a day. Or if I got invited to work for that company or if, or if I could run my own business or whatever it might be, you'd be like, that would be so cool, awesome to join in and do that. And if, it's that tr if, if that's true, and we would do it with joyful hearts to, to work with somebody like John Favreau, who I don't even really know, how much cooler is it that it's like the God of the universe, the one who, who created you, the one who knows you <laughs> intimately, who loves you and cares for you and says, hey, I'm inviting you to know me and to join with me in what I'm doing. Let's go. I mean, that would be like, how could that be a drag? Be like, man, I'm working with God today. Man, that, that's so awesome. And so th those are some of the reasons that, that hold us back from being laborers, for, for joining God with what he's doing. So what do we do? Right? If we're like, okay, we've identified, identified some problems, but now what? Here's what Jesus says. First thing, what does he say? Verse 38, therefore pray. Underline, circle, highlight. Therefore, pray to the Lord. Ask God. There, there, is a, there is a harvest. Ask God for laborers. Ask God to provide people. It's, it's, I love this because mission with God doesn't start with you. It starts with him. All right, come to me. People need to be loved. People need to be discipled, reached, loved, cared for. I'm drawing people to myself. Pray. Pray that I provide. On staff, we have our alarm set to, to 10.02 a.m. And it's based off of Luke 10.2, and it's, it's the same verse here in Matthew. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, so therefore pray to the Lord to provide labors for his harvest. And so we pray together as a staff, 
Every, every chance that when it, when it goes, that it's just like, hey, God, would you provide new city group leaders? God, would you provide new people to invest in the lives of kids and kids' ministry? God, would you provide just, just a, a, a heart and a passion for people at their workplace that they would just share with people at their work for neighborhoods, for neighbors, for, for people? Who, would you provide labors for the nations to go to share with those who have little to no access to the gospel. And I would say, gosh, I've seen God answer that prayer over and over again. People stepping up, people saying, hey, it's not about me. I'm not gonna just consume, I'm gonna contribute. People inviting people into their homes. And so, so, so many of you are answers to prayer. And so, so we pray. We ask God, would you provide People and, and I would say in this, we, as we pray, there is an implication in this that you're not always saying, God, provide other people for your harvest, but it's also, hey, God, I'll be your answer for that prayer. Saying, hey, God, it could be me too. And I know for some of you, it's like, ooh, I don't know. I don't know, man, that, that's tough. And, and so even if you're like, man, my heart is not in this. I don't have this desire. I don't have, I don't see what Jesus sees and I don't feel what Jesus feels. That's okay. What do we do? Pray. God, shape my heart. Shape, shape my mind. Help me to be more like you. Help me to see what you see. Help me to feel what you feel. Ask God to, to shape you. God, help me to see people at my workplace like you see them. Help me to see my kid. Help me to see the people in my city group like you see them. And help me to feel compassion and love for them like you feel. And so that's where, that's where we started. We, we just start by praying, going to God. Second thing I do is say, start just obeying. Start following, right? Jesus says that, hey, the workers uh, are few, so pray. And then he sends them out, sends out the 12. It doesn't say that the 12 disciples were like happy about it or anything. They just, they just go. And so if you're like, man, I don't have a lot of compassion for my neighbor, coworker, whatever, I would just say, just start praying for them. Not even just praying for yourself that God would shape you, just start praying for them. And I think that as you follow God and join with him, even a little bit in what he's doing, God's gonna shape your heart. Start, start off by, man, I don't know if I wanna invite that person over, just invite him over. And, and it's, it's, act, it's acting in faith that God's gonna shape you. I mean, I didn't really start following Jesus until I was in high school. And um, so when I was in high school, people did start talking about giving and, and money and all that. And I'm, it wasn't that big of a deal for me to give because I didn't really make very much money. So it was like, well, here's 10 bucks. Yay, worship. Boop. And then I got into college and it was kind of about the same. And then I graduated college and I was an intern at a church. And so it's still not that much. And then kind of right at the same time, my wife, Chris, and I both got salary jobs. And then it was just like, oh, wait a minute. Now what we're going to give, that number has suddenly increased. That 10%, 11%, whatever has gone up. And now this is like $500 a month or so. And it's like, eh, wait a minute. I don't, I'm not a cheerful giver, God. I don't want to do this. So I could either just not do it or it's just like, well, God, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to act in faith that you're going to change my heart. But I am a cheerful giver. And hopefully that'll happen someday. No, I'm just kidding. You guys, you guys are like, whoa. Um, no, it, it has gotten a lot better. But, but just start obeying God. And I get it. Life is busy. But I, invite somebody into doing something that you're already going to do. You're already going to take your kids to the zoo? Hey, you want to go with me? You're already going to go to the store. Maybe don't tell them you're going to go to the store because they might bail, but just be like, hey, you want to hang out? And then just go to the store with them. Hey, you're going to go golf? Go do that. Just invite them into what you're doing. But... but Pursue people. And I know that we, sometimes we say, well, I don't know if I'm called to that. We are, I mean, scripture's clear, we're all called. But it just depends where and how. Like what missionary Jim Elliott said. He's a missionary to Peru. He said, we don't need a call, we need a kick in the pants. Whatever God is going to do in this world, he's going to primarily do it through people. Whatever God is going to do in your home, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, he's primarily going to do maybe through you. 
We need to do it through people. The harvest is plentiful. I mean, people's lives can be changed for eternity. So, I, I mean, as we think about this, as we go to the world, go to our neighborhoods, go to our city groups, wherever they might be, to other people. Here, here's the thing, though, of, of, you know, we say, hey, we pray for change. We just start acting in obedience. And here's the other thing. We continue to look at Christ. Because if you're like, man, I want to have compassion for people, it doesn't start with your compassion for people. It starts with Jesus' compassion for you. It's not just that Jesus saw other people and had compassion for them. Jesus saw you. He saw you that were helpless. You that were lost in your sin. You that were like a sheep without a shepherd. You that were separated from him. And Jesus said, man, I don't just suffer with you. I will suffer for you. I will be the good shepherd and I will lay down my life for you so that you might know me. I have seen you and I have compassion for you. And his compassion is what shapes us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that you are, that you do see us, Lord, that you're not an ignorant God. You're not some dis, kind of distant God far off, Lord, but that you see us and that your heart is moved to compassion, to love for others. And so, Lord, I pray that as we just think through this, Lord, that one, that we'd be in awe of who you are, Lord, that, that we would, our hearts would be moved to worshiping you, to seeing just a, a bigger picture of who you are. And Lord, that you shape us, Lord, that we, you would shape us to be more and more conformed to the image of Christ, um, so that we would see what you see, that we'd feel what you feel, um, and just join in what you're doing, Lord. And so we just praise you. We ask this in Jesus.